The Nakabi Diaries, Season 4. Assalamu alaikum, ladies. Alhamdulillah, I finally did it. I actually wrote a book. It's dedicated to all the single Muslim mothers out there, hence the name How to Be a Single Muslim Mum. Inshallah, it's available as an ebook, paperback, and it will be available as an audio. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah Fikum sisters for the support. Check out the link in the description to get yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of the Naqabi Diaries. Alhamdulillah, we have with us another sister to share her Naqab journey with us in South, inshallah. Sister, could you please introduce yourself for the listeners and tell us a little bit about what you do, inshallah. Alright, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Zainab Yunusa. I am from Nigeria. My alias is Amira Tulkulu. I'm a personal blogger on Instagram. I'm also the co-founder of the Hyped Eid community, where we um give um uh, where we have a community of sisters from around the world to discuss Eid, how to make it memorable for the Muslim kids. We find out that in the Muslim household, we tend to look at other uh, festivities around. So we started the hybrid community to make Eid the member of the one and only um, festive um, event in a, in the Muslim household. Mashallah, Allahumma barik. You said it's called the Hype Eid community? The Hype Eid community. Mashallah, mashallah, very good, very nice. I think that's really important, actually. So, inshallah, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the discussion because that sounds like a really, really fantastic initiative. Um, so, um, sister, could you give us some insights into your Islamic background, inshallah, and let us know how did you come to be wearing the niqab? Okay, um, uh, we have an Islamia in my in our family house. Um, uh, my dad is a person of um. Um, he loved. He's a person that loves Islamic knowledge, and he just opened a school in our in our compound, in our family house. So we started learning the team since since we could we we could talk. That's all I can say, up till date. Alhamdulillah, it has not been an easy journey because we thought he was, uh, you know, trying to be hard on us. But now, Alhamdulillah, I'm. I'm really grateful to my father for pushing us to learn about the deen at a very young age, alhamdulillah. And for the niqab, um, even though my father was someone that loved uh, the Islamic uh, teachings, he wasn't someone that liked the niqab. And unfortunately or fortunately, I have always been in love with the niqab as a child. I would take my scarves and fold them to cover my face, to go to school and all of that. I just found it fascinating. I, I used to admire people that were that wore the niqab then. And um up until twenty nine twenty nine no, sorry, twenty seventeen. That's when I started wearing the niqab, December twenty seventeen. And I didn't look back. I just I started wearing it when going out of the house and when I would come back before entering the house I would remove it so that my dad wouldn't see it and on a faithful day I came back and greeted him he was outside I greeted him and went into the house up until when I was going to my room I now realized that oh I'm actually with the niqab no wonder he was looking at me like a stranger yeah and he didn't say anything up to now, have, uh, the niqab with him. I, no, no, nobody from my immediate family was against the niqab. However, from my extended family, oh, there was a lot of backlash. Why wearing this thing? You wouldn't get a husband if you wear this, and all of that, all the negative comments. But I, I'm not a person that gets uh, affected by people's words. Alhamdulillah for that uh, so there wasn't much hindrance from there uh some of my dad's friends would say ah wh- why do you allow her to wear this and he's like allow her to do what she wants so alhamdulillah my parents were really supportive of me and even, I mean, even though it was a all ladies event i had a walima for my wedding and it was all ladies however i still chose to wear my 
to to wear my niqab sorry i wore my, i wore my niqab and my my family members were supportive everyone was kind of against it i became the topic of the town during my wedding it was i got cyber bullied and all of that but uh, like i said it, i'm not the first that that gets uh easily affected by people's words because mm-hmm. when i put mm-hmm. my something and i know i'm doing it for the sake of allah i i just forget about everyone else and look at the end goal and that has been my motivation um at amira to go do i it's it's a small community even though it's my pen name i used to write poems mm-hmm. that, that's how i got the name i started blogging just sharing a few uh, verses some hadith some life lessons mm-hmm. as a muslim and then i started writing sisters um at least four times in a year to discuss various uh, pertinent topics um like the previous one we had in uh, last month was about uh, the uh, uh, the balance between deen and culture where we draw the line and you know which which way to go like especially with uh, our cultural background in nigeria how a lot of people are still um are still um what's the word deeply connected to their culture even if it has some contradictions to the deen they don't let go of it so we discussed on how to maneuver your way around it how to even educate the people in around you about what you should do in such situations alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Okay, so I want to I wanna take it back a little bit. Mashallah, you said a lot of things there, so very, very, lots of interesting stuff going on. Okay, so, right, so you mentioned that you started wearing the niqab in 2017. So can you just kind of break it down for us a little bit? You you said you're coming from an Islamic background. Mashallah, your, your father even made the Islamic school in your compound where you live. Um, for those of yes. us who are listening who don't understand the concept of compound in West African countries, usually we have homes with, you know, that have like maybe a wall around it, but it's like a piece of land. You know, you have your yes. land and you have your home and there could be several business buildings within a compound. Yeah. So that's like what you call the compound. Because obviously in the yes. UK, the setup is quite different. So, yeah. So, Thank alhamdulillah, you. Allah, you've got your own, kind, your own Islamic school within the compound. Your father ensured that you had a good Islamic education. So at this young age, while you was growing up, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm understanding from it is that you was accustomed to wearing the hijab from a young age as well. So um, I take it that was encouraged by your father, the actual wearing of the hijab itself, but not specifically when it came to the niqab. Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Whenever we would go out, he would always tell us to cover up and all of that. Well, I attended mm-hmm. a mixed school uh, that has mm-hmm. pres- it was a circular school, and the uniform was um, kind of short. However, he would make us get bigger uniforms, and we would actually mm-hmm. just uh, mix minor, um, minor. Uh, what's the word? Minor adjustments to fit us. Okay. But it was baggy. I got bullied for that, for, for wearing the long skirt and the baggy shirts because most of my mates and the, most of the students in the school I attended, even though they collected um, uniforms that were their sizes, they would still go ahead to trim them down to look you like know, smaller. Older. Yes. More oh, subhanAllah. So they do that. They do that there too, is it? SubhanAllah. I remember in the UK when we was going to school and I went to a Christian school, um, a Church of England. And SubhanAllah, that was what used to happen. And even in the Catholic girls school down the road, it was the same thing. You know, you have these big, big, big skirts as the uniform and you go and buy them. But the girls would always like, they would either roll them up to be short yes. or some of them would like cut them, you know. Yeah, SubhanAllah. Yes they would cut the skirts and actually fit them to, to fit them down however i would mm-hmm. wear my baggy uniform and keep going there was a time i remember when a student she was my classmate she called me after school hours and was like why do you wear your uniform like this can't you at least cut the skirt 
and trim it. Even your socks is your socks are long. You don't wear the ankle mm-hmm. big ankle socks were trending then. And mm-hmm. all of that. I was like, this is how I want to dress. What 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 is is it your body? It's not your body. This is how mm-hmm. I want to dress. But it didn't it didn't get to me really because I was you I was used to it. I I've been used to covering up whenever I would wear something tight and fitting. I would always feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Even when, before I started wearing the jilbab and abayas, I used to wear culture, uh, my cultural attire. I'm Hausa, and we would wear skirts and blouses and veils all over. Those days, I would wear. I I used to make gowns. Um, mm-hmm. with with my uh, with my Ankara, I would make gowns, free gowns, and I would use big big sized veils. Where usually is the married woman that use them in Nigeria? If you, so a lot of people's perception when you cover up is you are married. That's the first thing that comes yeah. to their mind, mostly. So um, a lot of people would say, "Ah, oh, you wear all these big, big veils. How would people know you are not married and all of that?" And Alhamdulillah, at that time, I I had joined some. Islamic organizations that used to organize halakas and all of that. So I was getting more knowledge of the deen and I would I had a better understanding of the deen then so it didn't bother me. It it didn't bother me. I kept going and alhamdulillah I am where I am today. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Okay, so mashallah, sounds like it, it definitely, you definitely had a journey there. So what age would you say you were when you actually started wearing hijab, like full-time, properly hijab? Uh, properly hijab, let's say um, around 2018, 20, yes, 2018. Sorry, okay. I'm not 20, 2017, when I started wearing the niqab. Okay, so so you wasn't wearing hijab full time before that. No, I would I would, I would cover up, but it wasn't the hijab. I would wear my ankara. Okay. And my, I would cover yes. Up, but it wasn't the proper hijab. Okay. Okay. Alhamdulillah. So um, all right then. So like okay, okay. So let us tell us about your first experiences with the niqab. Where did you get your first niqab? And actually, like you know, you you said you used to see people wearing the niqab as well, and you always find it fascinating. So. In your community, you know, which women did you kind of come into contact with or see that was wearing the niqab? Because I'm trying to understand, like, the, the differences, because obviously, like you said, that there's some people there, you know, there wasn't too kind of, um, they didn't find it appealing or they, they didn't like the idea of the niqab and, you know, questioning and you, they associate it with being married and things like that or have other negative, like, kind of connotations to go with it. So, but you have obviously seen some women wearing the niqab. So, which kind of women? When when would you see these kind of women that was wearing the niqab? Um, you know, um, in Nigeria, in the northern part of Nigeria, wearing the niqab was mm-hmm. more common than uh, mm-hmm. Abuja is actually. Um, I live in Abuja, which is the capital, mm-hmm. the federal capital territory, um, of Nigeria. I live here, and it's not common to see niqabis here. It wasn't common, actually. It wasn't. But now you you see a lot of niqabis, alhamdulillah. So um, in my hometown, a lot of people actually wear the niqab. Sometimes some people just wear it to when they're going out. Some other times they, they wear it uh, when they're getting married and they have to do the skin care and all of that so they don't get the sun born. And a lot of different reasons people wear the niqab. However, I would listen to lectures and um, I started following someone on Instagram. Um, there's uh, Aisha Bint Mahmoud. She's now my very, very good friend. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, mashallah. So, I spoke to her in season one. Alhamdulillah. She's lovely sister. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Okay. So she, she's now a friend. Um, she, she used to inspire me. And then there's Naima Roberts. Yes, Alhamdulillah. Well. well, everyone knows her. She's, mashallah, very popular, very famous. Our, our famous Nakabi Alamabari. And then quite a number of people. I can't even mention their names, but 
whenever I would see mm-hmm. Anikabi, I I like freak out. I'm fun girling. Oh my god, Anikabi! I still do that. Mashallah. When I see Anikabi in in Abuja where I live, I'm like, yes, Anikabi, and, and I just get okay, so yeah. excited. Okay, mashallah. So you was seeing Nakab in the your hometown in the north and also online and things like that. Okay, so where did you get your first Nakab from? Was it you, did you buy it from the north? Like what what kind of stages did you go to to prepare yourself for wearing it? I actually started folding my folding my veils to to make a Nakab. That's how I started. And um, where did I get my first Nakab from? I think a cousin gave bought me a niqab a maroon one if i can recall yes and also an aunt she lives in kaduna and a lot of people wear the niqab in kaduna because most of the islamia islamic schools in kaduna you have to wear a niqab it's part of their uniform so she got me some from there as well and i also got some from pure esteem it's a brand that sells hijabs, niqabs, and all that. Yes, mashallah. I know, I know their sisters as well. I love my body. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So you've got all the, you've got all the connections. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Okay, mashallah. Mashallah. Okay, so, um, right. So when you first put the niqab on, like when you actually bought a niqab, not your, using your veil to, you know, cover your face, like, you know, and you went out the first time. How was your experience? Because obviously, like, there's there's wanting to wear something, and then there's actually then putting it on. Like, how how did it feel for you? And I'm just giving you an example. When I started wearing the niqab, because I also had similar experience to you, and that I really wanted to wear it for the longest time, and I used to use my scarf to cover my face and things like that. Um, but I hadn't actually got an a niqab. So, Subhanallah, it it was quite difficult wearing the niqab for the first time because the one that I had, the fabric was really bad, and I couldn't breathe very well through it. So um, that wasn't the most positive experience for me, but I was still happy to wear it. And I still like, it didn't put me off wearing it basically. So how was it for you in, in your first time going out with the niqab on? SubhanAllah, I just remembered my first niqab belonged to my late mom. She went for, I think, Umrah or Hajj and got a niqab from Saudi. So she was unpacking her stuff and I saw it and she gave it to me. And but she told me that my dad didn't really like it, so that's why she has been keeping them in the box. But I took them two of them, two black niqabs. I remember now. So um, the 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 niqabs were really comfortable, the ones I started wearing. However, along the way, I got one that uh, I felt like suffocating after wearing. It. So up till now, I still have it. But it's just there for decoration. <laughs> I because I can't even give it out to someone. I don't know how. Maybe it might suffocate them, so I just kept it. I look at it and I'm like, oh okay. Now some of my friends call me a niqab expert, and I, because I tell them, oh, there's butterfly, there's single layer, there's this one, there's this niqab, there's this niqab, and they're like, oh, how did you, how do you know about all the different types of niqabs? And I'm like, I did my research. So, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Mashallah. There's really so many different types, isn't there? And it's, it's down yeah. to, it's, it's good to try them out so that you can find out what suits you best as well, like what you feel most comfortable in, you know? Exactly. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, um, since wearing the niqab, have you, have you faced, would you say that you faced any abuse for wearing it? You mentioned that you're living in Abuja and there's more and more niqabis, you know, in the city now, alhamdulillah, but have you ever experienced any abuse for wearing the niqab? Um, yes, especially when I'm driving on the road. Uh, we have a lot of different types of drivers in Nigeria, God. So some people will be like, you are covering your eyes. You can't even see why are you driving the car and all of that, things like that. And sometimes when you stop at the traffic light, you clearly know that people are staring at you. Some are ogling at you, especially kids from other cars. I turn around and I see kids staring at me and they're like, all even saying, mommy, look at this person. What is she wearing? And I go ahead to just tell them, I'm dressed like Batman. Hello, how are you? <laughs> and, you know, just make fun of the situation. Sometimes I wave at people when they when they stare at me. Clearly, they're staring at me. I just wave at them and 
drive off sometimes they don't even realize that the light color has changed at the traffic so things like that or you sometimes there was a time i went to the market to get some shoes and the guy was like i said i i was with my sister she was wearing the the uh jilbab and i told her oh look this shoe is even dirty and the guy was like oh you're the dirty people I, I'm even sure that you don't even have the money to buy the shoes. You cannot afford it and all of that. And wow, we, just, subhanAllah. we went away to a different vendor. We bought the shoes. And when we were, I was the one that drove the car. So when we were driving out of the market and he saw us driving, he was like, ah, Hadiana, you be this. Like, oh, is this you? So he was there one ah, ah. So he assumed I didn't have money to buy his shoes, and he now he now saw me driving a car. So things like that. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. Um. So what about in in when you're traveling around the the country? Do you face have you faced any abuse while traveling, and have you done any traveling outside of Nigeria with the Nakab at all? I have actually traveled to. Just a few states within uh, Nigeria and to just a few countries abroad as well, which are uh, the United Kingdom. I, I went to Bradford and Leeds last year. I didn't face any challenges, I must say. And uh, also uh, Dubai and Saudi, that's not a problem, right? Um, so in Nigeria, I've only traveled to the northern states uh kano kaduna jigawa um Bauchi. i have been to i have been to Maiduguri, but that was before uh starting the wearing the niqab so that's even out of the question and then lagos state and alhamdulillah even in lagos there are a lot of people that wear the niqab there as well mashallah Inshallah. So you've, you've really done quite a fair bit, bit of traveling there, um, and then I can't there, alhamdulillah. So even when you went to the airport, you didn't have any kind of issues in the UK or anywhere else? No, not really. Not that I can recall. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, okay then. So um, I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, your initiative that you started for for AIDS. Can you talk a little bit more about that and kind of what got you started off with it? And you know, like when when did you start it? Basically, your high high AIDS is it called high AIDS community? Hype hype that H Y P E hype yeah. H Y P E D. Hype to AIDS. Okay, great. Yes, yeah, so hype to AIDS community. Okay, yeah. Inshallah, Bismillah. Let's go. Let's let's see what. Tell us what all about it. Okay, it started in twenty twenty, I think. Yes, just on WhatsApp, a friend was craving cake, and she was like, "Wait, I want to eat cake. Why don't we have cake for Eid? Like you know how we are trying to get off birthday cakes. Why don't we have cake for Eid?" And I replied her and said, "Yes, that sounds like a good idea. We could have a group so that we can discuss about Eid." Um, you know, to, to motivate each other. In Nigeria, we celebrate Eid, especially in the north. There's the carnivals, uh, the festivities there. But um, as we grow older, we tend to just relax with the celebrations. We just uh, sometimes wear new clothes and that is it. We don't feel the hype, you know. So we started with the community on whatsapp it, it started as a whatsapp group uh, i added my friends she added hers and we we were discussing okay decorations uh diys we sent some videos we even got some people that were crafty uh, on the platform they came in uh, with their expertise and we thought we could we wish we could go bigger with it we expanded to instagram where we we're posting um, ideas and we we're posting different things from the platform. And last year, um, we had a bazaar, a fun fair during Eid. That's the maiden edition community bazaar. And Alhamdulillah, it was a success. We um, 
in Nigeria, there are a lot of conferences happening around all year round. But ours was different because there was no uh, lewd music. Um, we just had the nasheed. We had um, Quran competition um, for the kids. We we did a lot of uh, fun activities. There was archery. There was painting. There was crafts. We had a virtual reality uh, games, and then we even sold a, a um, exhibition booths for vendors. Um, also, on the community, we have a, 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 our vendor community as well because there are a lot of business owners. So we gave them the avenue to okay, showcase no what. Pardon? Fantastic. I was just saying, okay. mashallah, it sounds really amazing. Yes. So, um, for example, I can ask on the group, oh, hi, I'm in Kano and I'm looking for a vendor that makes cakes. I want to make cake for this Eid. And everyone that sells cake, uh, we have collated. Before on the group, it was just like, oh, I sell cake, I sell cake, I sell cake. But it was becoming too rowdy. So we created a form for all the vendors to register and we categorized them and posted on our Instagram page. So when you go on our Instagram page on the highlights, you see the list of vendors over there for the different locations. Mashallah. Mashallah. So very well organized then, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And also last, uh, just before um, Ramadan 2024, Ramadan 14, we had an event for kids aged ages 3 to 15 years. We called it Heck Mania, the hyped community mania, the hyped Ramadan experience, where we hosted the kids. Wow. Fun activities from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. with a lot of fun activities. We prayed, we ate, we had fun. There was scavenger hunt, uh, cutting. We made Ramadan crowns. We made buntings, and we had jars, charity a day jar. We also had uh, um, duas there, and they had a lot of fun. And inshallah, this Ramadan, just the Last weekend before Ramadan, we'll be having Hekmania 2.0, where we'll host uh, another set of kids to get them hyped for Ramadan. Because we started with Ramadan oh, yeah. because when the kids don't understand what Ramadan is, how do we explain Eid al-Fitr to them? Do you get mm -hmm. So we now started bringing the hype to Ramadan and then Eid al-Fitr and then Eid al-Adha. And, and inshallah, we hope oh, to grow bigger. Inshallah, inshallah, and, and may Allah put much barakah in it. It sounds amazing and really fun, subhanAllah. I think sometimes, I think, um, you know, like obviously like Nigeria's got, you know, there's Muslims, there's Christians, so it's like a mixed, you know, religious community there. But I think, and as even coming from the UK as well, I think for some some places, maybe like, you know, Muslim countries, they might not understand when, you know, we have to, you know, if you're living in a country that's not like a, a Muslim country or predominantly Muslim, like it, you have to make that extra effort to, you know, kind of celebrate aid and things like that, you know, especially when you move to a town where you're not like the Muslims aren't the majority because like it's easy to, you know, kind of, especially you, you get, when you grow as you get to be an adult, you know, you're not a child anymore. And, you know, or maybe if you, maybe if your children are um, grown up, for example, you know, it's easy to kind of get into um, a habit of not making a big deal about AIDS, you know, and it's important for the children, especially for the young ones. And I think those of us, even who whose children maybe who have already grown up, you know, there's it's so it's having something like what you started as a way to reintegrate those sisters and, and even brothers back into, you know, creating the hype around Eid and making it something exciting so they can also get involved, even though their children have grown. Because inshallah, they will be having their own grandchildren soon, you know, and it's something we, you know, it's traditions that we need to carry on to make our children feel that excitement about Eid because this is our days of celebration. And especially for those of us who, um, you know, don't celebrate birthdays as well. Um, and obviously, if if they, if our children are going to mixed schools where there's maybe Christians or people who are celebrating other um, other religions, um, you know, festivities, it's important to have the aid. You know, we have to make sure that we, you know, like do its justice. You know, let the kids be excited about it. So 
Alhamdulillah, that sounds it sounds like an amazing idea. Alhamdulillah, really, yeah, really that, nice. That was, that was the push. That was because we want to bring the the hype back. We want it to be hyped. This is the only mm -hmm. time we read as Muslims. So let's do it in a grand way. And Alhamdulillah, from the community, you could see a lot of people have have given their reviews that the kids look forward to Eid. Even they themselves look forward to Eid. And something we also do at the Hive Date community, um, we, you know, for Eid al-Adha is about the sacrifice. And in Nigeria, we all fry our meat and mm -hmm. it gets hectic. By the time Eid al-Adha is over, most of the women are tired and exhausted because all they did during that period was fry meat. Some, some even take yeah. three days working around Eid. So they don't get to celebrate it. Uh, so we hosted mm. a chef, um, Chef Hafsi, and she gave us some um, meal prep tips for Eid and for Ramadan as well. Yes, we did that in Ramadan. How to make Ramadan easy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's fantastic because that's that's another problem i think uh, for a lot of sisters even in the uk have this issue with ramadan obviously we're fasting during ramadan but you know some sisters it's known that in some communities they spend literally the whole day in the kitchen just preparing food for iftar and you think subhanallah well we're supposed to be fasting and by the time iftar yeah. comes like you know there's a there's a massive feast on the table and this is where people fall into unfortunately the bad habit of overeating at the iftar time as well um you know which is not very healthy but you know the excitement of getting food when you've not eaten for the whole day obviously like you know can like take over one's mind so far and you know so this is this is part of the issue as well so some sisters because of spending a lot of time in the kitchen they don't get much yeah. time for a badder and as well, you know, if you've been in the kitchen all day, by the time you've had your iftar, you're tired. And it makes it hard to even, you know, continue with it about it in the nighttime and having energy for taraweeh and these kind of things. So it's important to have these practical tips, time-saving tips for, for being in the kitchen, you know, all these meal prep ideas and stuff like that. Alhamdulillah, it's, it's, it's a good way to, you know, help sisters manage their, their home lives a lot better, inshallah. Okay, mashallah. So I think um, you said you've got your online community. So we definitely have to share that in the description box for other sisters, because even if they're not in Nigeria, maybe they can also get, you know, or use the similar um, ideas, how you've, you know, gone about setting up your things. So wherever they live, they could also start the same initiative, inshallah. Because I think that's a really, really, really good idea. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So I just posted the, um, the, in the Instagram a handle the fantastic fantastic yeah. yeah that's great i've saved that alhamdulillah barakallah alaykum okay alhamdulillah so um back to talking about the niqab so you mentioned um in the beginning like with regards to um you mentioned about how your walima actually i wanted to ask you about that um you said that, so obviously some people thought that when you start covering your face, you wouldn't be able to get married and all that you were made to find a job. So yes. did you, I know you obviously you did get married. I wanted to ask you two I, questions. How did you, did you get a job? And um, when you got married, like how did you actually manage to find a husband? Um, my husband is a family friend. He's a family friend. Uh, we have been close with ever since childhood uh so I went to visit his sister he saw me after years and he's like oh okay he got he got my contact from his sister and we got talking okay, alhamdulillah so i'll take it that he was happy um with you wearing the niqab Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I always ask these questions because obviously there's some young sisters that are listening sometimes and this is one of the fears or one of the kind of, um, you know, like assumptions that are made that, you know, that kind of uh, people use to try to put them off, you know, adopting the niqab when they're not married. So yeah, I think it's important, so, you know, that those of us who have been able to get married while wearing the niqab, like share our, you know, experiences or stories of that so that people can know that, you know, it's Allah that's going to find your husband, you know, alhamdulillah. Yeah, barakallah. Okay, so so what about working as well? Have you done any kind of work with the niqab as well? Um? Yes, I have gotten a work, however... 
Um, not with the niqab. I w- I was mm-hmm. wearing the niqab for the job. However, they don't allow it at my workplace. So instead, I wear a face mask at the office, and when I come out, I wear my niqab. Okay, okay, mashallah. So, yeah. mashallah, However, sister, that's innovation right there. You've managed to work your way around it. Alhamdulillah. However, during COVID, I was wearing my mm-hmm. niqab because everyone was wearing the face mask. Nobody was even raised any questions or concerns about the niqab until post COVID when um yes. it's not mandatory to wear the face mask. Mm-hmm. That uh, the questions started coming. Why do you cover your face and all of that? Uh, some people felt threatened, and I was mm. called in in that people, my colleagues feel threatened about my covering. So, um. I need to take it off. Oh, do I have anything? So to it's fine, no problem. And when I'm wearing the face mask, nobody's saying anything about it because it's a face mm-hmm. mask. Of it. Some people and your face, need. It's a problem. It's it's crazy, isn't it? You was wearing the niqab yeah. during the COVID, and nobody had a problem. But as soon as you don't have to wear a face mask, now the niqab is threat for them. Is it? Subhanallah. It is. I even during COVID, I made a post and said, "How hypocritical is man mm. that now we're all covering our faces?" I hope that when COVID is over, we don't go back to telling people off when they wear the niqab, and it's happening really. And mm. it's subhanallah. And when you remember that man is insane, indeed, so. We mm-hmm. we have forgotten that we were all Nikabis at one point, even the men. So we are they have forgotten. Yes, I do. People tease me mm-hmm. that am I trying to bring back COVID because I'm wearing face mask all the time and I just wow, ignore them. Wow. Sometimes I I try to to throw back the joke at them and all of that. So So what kind of work do you, what kind of work do you do, sister? I work with the, with the government. I'm a civil servant. Okay. okay, alhamdulillah. 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 So, would you? Are there other like sisters, Muslim women, who are also doing the same work where you where you work? And um, I'm like, do they wear hijab or are they also wearing their garb as well? The 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 abaya and the veil is allowed. You can wear. You can cover okay. up. However, it's mm-hmm. just the niqab that is a problem. Okay, so on that note, would you say that you feel that sisters who wear the niqab get treated differently from sisters who wear the hijab? Generally? Yeah. People that wear the niqab are put on a pedestal. And I always tell mm-hmm. people, just because you see me wearing the niqab does not mean... I am closer to Allah than you, or I am mm-hmm. a, um, an alima or a sheikha or a learned person. I'm a student of knowledge. I am nowhere near perfect. I'm not perfect. So when you see me doing something with my niqab, don't blame the niqab. Blame Zainab. Zainab is the one doing it, not the niqab, not, uh, mm-hmm. not the deen. But yes, people that wear the niqab are treated differently. Okay, okay, subhanAllah. So, um, and would you say that the niqab was a barrier? And if so, in which sense? Honestly, it's not a barrier for me. Alhamdulillah for being in a country that has, uh, that is, that has, that is Muslim populated. There are more Muslims in Nigeria than any other religion. And. Well, uh, I'm not on from my own end. It's not a barrier. I don't know if it's from my mindset that nothing can stop me, <laughs> even whatever happens, happens. There was an incident though that someone asked me how I see with the niqab on. That was when I even mm-hmm. started with. How do you see with this thing on on your face? And I'm like, okay, there's this notion that people from the north, not the northern, um, the 
in Nigeria that people from the north are illiterate. To top mm. it all, I'm wearing the hijab and the niqab. I just looked at the person and said, do you know that I have a degree in software engineering? I'm a software engineer. And I am that with my niqab. So just because I'm covering my face does not block my senses. It does not affect anything that I do. I just choose mm -hmm. to cover. And the person was like, oh, I see. You mean to say you're a software engineer? And I said, yes, I am. So, oh, okay. And the conversation died. SubhanAllah. I saw the respect. I, I did. I have never interacted with the person, so I, I don't even think she thought I could speak English. Again, the notion that the northern Nigerian person is an illiterate, she doesn't know English, she doesn't know anything, and all of that. We all, we only know about cows and farming and uh, animals. But her, her perspective changed. And ever since, she would say, hi, how are you? Whenever she sees me. It was no longer mm. the side, the bombastic side eye. It was greeting. And you know what I find sad, I think, just in, you know, being in West Africa in general, is this kind of perception in that we have about farmers. I think that's just bad on its own, you know, like that we look down on people who do farming and, who are actually the ones growing food and things like that. Because Subhana, food is important for everybody. And I think that, you know, we're blessed in West Africa. Like a lot of our lands is so fertile and the food grows very quickly and easily. And, you know, but yet the people who are, you know, working hard to make, you know, this happen, uh, look down on, you know, and, you know, we, we all need to eat, you know, Subhana. So even if somebody hasn't been educated in the, in in you know like western terms or you know gone to university and these things doesn't mean that the person is 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 ignorant or foolish you know if they're coming from a family or farming and things like that because there's a lot of um benefits from farming and and especially these days like with you know there's a lot of knowledge that you know people are missing because they haven't or they've neglected you know this kind of um, knowledge of nature and farming and how to grow food like you know the most effective way like which foods to grow together all these there's so plants upon that there's like so much like knowledge in agriculture that has been lost because people are not um you know paying attention to it and you know i, I know there's some places in, in, in some western countries where they're trying to rediscover these things now to make the most of growing food naturally and you know to be most beneficial and you know without using like for example pesticides or um artificial fertilizers and stuff like that but we're losing these things in in africa because we don't take farming seriously and we think that it's something lowly and you know like we look down on people who do that and it's it's not it's not it's not the right attitude to have subhanallah it's sad have you met any sisters who would like to wear the niqab but they're not allowed to wear it no okay I'm glad. and what about sisters who are forced into wearing it have you ever met one no, I haven't. Okay, alhamdulillah. And what advice would you give to sisters who are contemplating wearing the niqab? Um, my advice would be to set your intentions right, to get it right. Whatever you want to do, do it for the sake of Allah. If you want to wear the niqab, do it for the sake of Allah. Do your research about it. Have a good reason on why you want to wear it and just do it. Inshallah, inshallah. And lastly, sister, what does the niqab mean to you? The niqab means quite a lot to me. It means security, it means it means watching myself because um, you know, when you wear the niqab, you find yourself being conscious of whatever it is that you do. And it makes me, yes, it makes me um, mindful of what I do and what I say and how I do things. 
and it's a constant reminder for me to do things for the sake of Allah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Barakallah. We can thank you so much, sister, for giving your time today and, you know, doing this interview with us. I really appreciate it. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Barakallah. For all the good work you've been doing, we appreciate you. Amen, amen. Wa'iyakum, wa'iyakum, sister. So, inshallah, take care. And definitely, we're going to put the links to your, um, you know, hype to Eid and everything in the description box so sisters can get access and, um, you know, learn something as well, inshallah, and take part and hopefully, you know, do the same thing where they live or get involved in, you know, your community that you've already got established, inshallah. Inshallah. We're, we're, I look forward to welcoming you at the Hive Deed community. Inshallah. I would love it. Yes, definitely. Inshallah. Inshallah. All right. Barakallah alaykum, sister. Have a blessed okay. evening, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.